what would you make of the critique that two kingdom theology makes you makes one too passive in the in the broader cultural world? Yeah. Uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to have to call you out on uh, two kingdoms. The I would, uh, <laughs> you can use the term, of course, if you oh, want. Yeah. I I don't like the term two kingdoms theology. It makes it. I I don't. To me, it's just a kind of a reformed biblical theology that I'm trying to understand and and teach. And the two kingdoms is is just it, it's actually a traditional category in reformational thought generally and reformed uh, Christianity uh, s- specifically. And so. Uh, I just, I, I think sometimes, I, I'm not saying you were trying to do this, but sometimes people use this as sort of a way to make it some sort of idiosyncratic, odd oh, okay. thing that's out there. It's two kingdoms theology. So, But it's got a long history and a long tenure in Reformed Christianity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, 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 it definitely does. Um, all the way back to John Calvin, uh, who, 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 who spoke in these terms. Mm-hmm. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to say that because it... Um, I, I didn't mean it as a criticism of you personally, but it's just, it's a little pet peeve of mine. Um, <laughs> so for folks who have, for folks who don't like this view, if their objection is it makes Christians too passive yeah. in the public square, what's yeah. the, what's the answer to that objection? I, I think that the, the answer is it has never been meant to promote retreat or passivity in the public square. I mean, I just mentioned John Calvin. I mean, does anyone really think that John Calvin was out for, um, for Christians not being involved in the public square. I mean, in the very, you know, he, Calvin talks about this actually several places in, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Um, one of the places he does it is in Book 4, Chapter 20, which is when he talks about civil government and very famous discussion of there about the purposes of civil government and the goodness of Christians being, you know, having political office. Uh, so... It, it certainly has not meant that. Uh, I have never meant uh, to promote that. And I don't think I don't think anyone who looks at my at my life or the kind of things that I write about. I mean, I've written about I don't know so many issues of public affairs that uh, it's. I just think this is uh, it's kind of a straw man. Now maybe someone has met someone who says I'm because of the two kingdoms. I don't need to be, I don't need to care at all about, okay, maybe you've met that person. I don't think that's representative yeah. of what the two kingdoms has meant historically uh, in uh, reformed uh, Christianity. What I would say is it, I think it does give us a certain perspective on how we participate in public affairs. I think it can equip us with a certain kind of attitude, with certain kinds of expectations uh, and I think those are very helpful, but it's not, uh, it's certainly, I would say that this, this idea has never been meant to dissuade people from being involved. Mm. Is there such thing as a neutral public realm? Well, no, I don't, I don't buy that. There's not a, there's no moral neutrality in this world. One of the things I've written a lot about is the importance of the covenant with Noah after the flood, mm. uh, at the end of Genesis eight, uh, uh, and, uh, into Genesis nine, uh, where God promises, this is God says, this is how I am going to govern the world from now until as as long as this world endures. So basically, until the end of history, until the final judgment, this is how God says He's going to uh, govern this world. He promises uh, to preserve this world um, uh, for all people, for the entire human race. Makes His covenant with all living beings, and this this does mean one of the things this means is that we're all accountable to God. Uh, whether you're a believer or unbeliever, you're accountable to God who sustains this world and continues to make his, uh, his law known even in the created order. And so I, I would never want to defend the idea of some sort of a neutral public square or neutral politics or, or something. And I do think that we as Christians should, in, in our various vocations, as we have various opportunities to be engaged in this world and different Christians obviously have different places in this world, different opportunities. We should strive for excellence. We should we should promote what is just and what is right. Uh, but I think we need to, it's very important, I think, to avoid doing it in the name of some sort of attempt to reestablish Christendom. Mm. And this is another thing that I've 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 done some writing about the and I think this fits into the whole Christian nationalist theme. Christendom can mean some different things, but uh, one of the historical meanings of it is sort of this long, long experiment, especially in the West, 
of a kind of a unified Christian society in which, whether it's the church or the state or any other thing, it all kind of unified in this confessionally Christian way and really began in the late early church and, uh, or that sounds a little strange to say late early <laughs> church, uh, early middle ages maybe is a better way to say it and mm -hmm. continued on really until relatively recently in human history. It's kind of, we've kind of gradually lost it over the last few hundred years. Um, but that involved the, the idea that we, we enforce Christianity, Christian orthodoxy with the sword. Uh, and we, uh, there was a lot of bloodshed uh, in the name of Christendom. And uh, I, I, I am convinced for a lot of theological reasons that we don't want to go back on that road to try to reestablish Christendom. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we um, just give up. I, I don't know how you put it, but they, yeah. you know, the idea that we just, just let retreat. it go or we retreat. No, I, I don't think we uh, retreat at all. I think we are called to live in this world. I was just talked for a few minutes with my students in class this morning about 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul is trying to, he's urging the church to discipline this member in their congregation who's engaged in unrepentant, serious sexual immorality. And he says, you know, I don't associate with sexually immoral people. And then he immediately says, I'm not talking about the sexually immoral of this world. Otherwise, you'd have to leave this world. Yeah. And the implication there, it's very clear, is you're not supposed to leave this world. You, you need to be in this world. Uh, and uh, we need to engage people and uh, we need to try to promote uh, what is right as we can. But those are a lot of ideas. And, and I, I, one thing that I would say is that these issues that we're talking about, these kind of Christianity and culture, or political theology or whatever, they're, 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 they can be kind of complicated, mm -hmm. complex uh, issues and easily subjected to kind of rhetoric uh, and slogans the way uh, I, so the uh, my book living in God's two kingdoms my original title for that what I thought was a great title was living in Babylon uh, but the publisher didn't didn't think that was a good <laughs> idea 